Well, hello, Fierce Factor Podcast. I am so excited for this incredible interview today with my dear friend, Vaughn. Uh, Vaughn is someone who I met way back when in the industry, and um, <laughs> we have kept in touch over a decade, um, you know, really navigating through different roles in the industry. And I asked Vaughn to come and chat with me, one, just as a friend, because I'm excited to have like a friendly chat. Um, and we, coming from in industry, have a unique perspective in the sense that we've watched how things have evolved and been a part of, you know, the sales and marketing and development and business growth behind the scenes, um, really selling into and partnering with practices. And while we both work on within the industry in different sort of segues or segments or different areas and have different perspectives now, we're just always so aligned in um, our approach to business. And so we wanted to chat with uh, Vaughn. And Vaughn, um, welcome today, and thank you. Where are you Hi. tuning in from? I'm actually at the home office in Dallas at Revision Skincare. I uh, stuck away into a conference room so I could chat with you. Yay! I'm so excited to have a chat. We joked about having a cocktail, and she said, I'm at the office, Kaylee. I was like, oh, yeah, not everybody just gets to have a cocktail every <laughs> time. Um, no, all joking aside. So Vaughn, um, why don't you go ahead and just start off by giving the um, audience here a little bit of background about you, maybe a little bit about our history and how we met and, you know, what, what you're doing now with Revision. Yeah, so um, I am with Revision Skin Care. I'm the regional sales director for the central region. Uh, central means a lot of things, mostly Texas, but also, uh, let's see, Colorado, Louisiana, Arkansas, and uh, Oklahoma. So that's central as of right now. I've been here for about two years, but yes, I met Kaylee at Candela Medical about a decade ago. And it's funny you say how we align on things always because I still remember the day I met you. Um, I was the eighth female hired for that hybrid position at Candela, at least sunk into to selling devices. And um, there was a conference in Chicago and I went, I didn't know anybody, but I kind of gravitated towards Kaylee right away because there's something about this very kind of size me up, cutthroat kind of vibe you gave off. And I was like, you know what? I'm into that because I have the same vibe. I think I just hide it a little bit better than you do. <laughs> uh, but I knew. I knew that we're going to be okay. And I think we push each other a lot in great ways um, while we got to work together. Yeah. I don't remember that specific meeting, but that's funny. Yes. I think we were, we were healthy competitors and friends and challenged each other a lot. So you're going to, you're going to make me say it, aren't you? No, no, Kaylee no. Kaylee beat no. me our first year <laughs> in sales uh, for rep of the year by pennies, but you know what? A win's a win. She still let me hang out in her suite in Vegas at our national sales meeting, even though I didn't win. We had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. We had some good times back then. Um, so from, so coming from a device and I left, I left the company and really I started my own business seven, I guess, seven years ago now. And you just kind of continued on the path in terms of development within that company and on the device side, and then now moved into skincare. So what's that been like for you? Oh, it's been quite a journey, you know, um, being at Candela, I was there for about eight years. Uh, in the field and in management and just the industry has evolved so much. So I feel like you and I, like we we're saying cutthroat, we were both aiming to climb that corporate ladder and you think aesthetics and skincare and, and everything. And you, you think really feminine, female patients and, and consumers, but it's still to this day, a very male driven industry. So like I said, I was the eighth female hired uh, for that program and with us, we've always looked to, to climb the ladder for the next opportunity to get into leadership, and opportunity was sparse. It was very sparse, um, not just for women in general. I feel like we went through lots of different hands of ownership and management. I think, was it seven CEOs in seven years we are talking about earlier? So um, there was never opportunity. It was already spoken for. When you hear about uh, a position, you never really got to throw your hat in for it, and at the time, female mentorship really didn't exist. There wasn't any, weren't very many females in leadership to even help you kind of pave that path. Yeah. And I kind of felt like there was a lot of, especially going through those big transitions when you bring in a new CEO, right? As an example, 
it takes a lot of time to like rebuild culture and shift direction, you know, in a huge organization like that. And so you would, ha we'd have CEOs that would essentially bring in like their regime from the last company they were at sure. you know, come in and just take things over. And here, you know, we're like reps and trying to make our way up, like, you know, for opportunities and climb that ladder when there isn't really somebody there that is invested in pulling you up with them, right? Or like, help pull, you know, helping navigate and show you the way and taking you under their wing. Right. And I mean, I, at the time I had such a linear career path, it was rep, kill it as a rep, and then, you know, regional sales director and continue climbing. I've learned so much since then as well. Yeah. So I do want to get into more of that, but I would love to hear now because now you have moved into a management role at Revision. Um, you know, what's that been like for you? What is, what's been the most rewarding part of being a manager and a leader now that you have the opportunity to really shift that narrative? Yeah. So I actually, I left Candela and came back for a management position. So I did get to manage at Candela and I managed their field sales associate program. And at the time it was 26 junior reps that had less than a year of sales experience in the entire country in Canada. I was on the road the whole time, but I loved that program um, because it was, you get two years to either, I'm going to show you how to be a rep. And as a 20 something, you're going to make a quarter of a million dollars plus, or you're going to fail out of my program. It was a hard program, you know, and um, COVID ended that program. And then I ended up coming to revision and um, it's been a great shift because I always like to look at the goal of my reps who I'm managing. And, you know, I love growing people professionally and personally, you know, for my team, whenever we do business plans, it's also, what are your personal goals? And it, I'm going to hold you to that. If your personal goal is to spend more time at your cabin, I'm going to ask you, are you going to the cabin this weekend? If you say no, I'm going to ask you why, you know, because um, I love that, that balance and having, um, I don't want to say work-life balance. We never have that, but I'm going to encourage you to have a life as well. Yeah. Um, but I take the responsibility really seriously. It's um it's an opportunity for me, but I also feel responsible for your career path. So trusting me with helping you get to where you want to get, because I know how hard it was for me. And, you know, that's what we're talking today too, but also more importantly, how are you providing for your family? Um, that's what I take very seriously. Uh, I, I lose sleep at night. If I feel like someone's missing their numbers and I'm like, oh my gosh. So it's those kids are going to have to go to community college, you know? So really it's an honor. Um, and I make sure I don't take that for granted ever. Yeah, no, you do love your team. You talk about them a lot and people. Do you feel like a lot of your inspiration for the way that you lead your team has come from things that maybe were lacking for you as um, as you were a rep and going through, you know, just your your the track of development? Yeah, so I feel like, you know, we always pull from our experiences, right? Good and bad. Um, and I was able to be a part of a team where our leader at the time, he really valued us being a team, hired a bunch of people kind of in that same mindset of the field sales associate, um, not a lot of experience, but he hired people with character and heart and said, I'm going to show you how to make a lot of money. And those folks, we stayed friends. You know, some of them were my wedding. I still vacation with some of them. So yeah. I pulled from that experience of how close we were because we cared about each other as a team and our leader cared about us as well. Um, I also form experiences because we've worked for good managers and bad. And when I say bad, having a leader, I can't even call it a leader, having a boss that says, this is how I do it. This is how it works. You need to do it the same way. It's very limiting and it's not very motivating. Um, but working for someone that says, you know what, let me figure out your skill set. Let me you know, help you grow those, actually exploit your skill set um, and help you with your weaknesses. I feel like that's huge. You know, I try to learn my people um, higher based on character because I can't teach you how to want to win, uh, how to want to be the best, but I can teach you about ingredients and technology and tissue interaction or whatever that may be, but getting out of bed is something you have to do on your own. Yeah, totally. And I think like remembering too, that what you're saying about investing in people as human beings, we forget that as sometimes business owners, we're thinking so much about our what, what I need for my business and the results and profitability. And, you know, that we almost make the fact that human beings, we employ humans, right? Not robots. And they yeah. actually get out of bed and show up and invest their life every single damn day into, 
you know, or for a reason. And it's most likely not because they care so much about my business profitability, right? There's something that, you know, there's a, a link between their values and, and mine that's going to help them feel more fulfilled in, in their, in their job, in their life. And if the job is not aligning its core values, or it's not aligned in terms of the right fit for helping them develop as a human in those ways, then it just, no one's going to get up and want to work. <laughs> well, we forget that about our customers too. We show up yeah. and we try to shove a solution, a product down their throats and forget that they're human beings. Yeah. And they're there. And the business that we are selling into is what provides for them and their staff and their families and all those things as well. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because uh, I've seen, um, and as my own career is obviously taken different twists and turns as well, this is, a, you know, one of the, I guess, a core, um, I guess, thread woven through the tapestry of like how I believe this industry can and will succeed that I remember back in the days, um, and I think we both have a, a unique perspective, having been rep selling skincare and then also capital. So we have both of those. So I want to talk about that in a minute, but you know, the approach to how back in the, like, remember when we first started selling and our boss would say, um, you know, would sell it, $2 million in one small little territory, you know, 2 million a year and, or a quarter or whatever. And like, they use the example of like sitting in their underwear on the couch and faxes were coming in for devices because there was like one of them. Like there was, it was like, oh, it's a laser. Yeah. Everybody wanted a laser. Like the aesthetic industry was so excited about it. And so like sales were so passive, you know? And then you get to this point where there's more and more and more competition. And as I'm leaving the industry, you know, the big thing are like the big signature events and, you know, guys are, they're just bringing everybody into these events. They're all getting labeled on who's potential going to buy you know, guys are getting Rolexes at the end of the night. Like it's just this like fast, right? And and so it's just this like hardcore, like all the focus is on sales. And then to your point of these practice development teams, like if companies aren't cutting it, like if they need to cut budget, that's the first thing that's going to go, you know, it's who's producing direct sales and a lack of value around the support of the practice or the buyer. So when you talk about that, you know, the consumer, um, you know, what are your thoughts around, like, are those days over? Like the hardcore, you know, like laser wrap, pushing sales, like, you know, like what's the analogy? What's the best way to get rid of a sales rep? Buy a laser. Because the best way to get rid of a laser rep is to buy a laser. Yeah, and right, exactly. Folks, I mean, yeah. So what are your thoughts about that? End. Well, they're never going to go away. And when you show up to a laser event and there is a certain color dot on your name tag, that means something. Consumers yep. don't think it doesn't, don't think it's just a pretty color. Right. Um, but those aren't going to go away, you know, and you're right. Think about when there were very limited competitors in device and in skincare. I mean, skincare, we compete against other medical grade skincare. We compete against over the counter. We compete against overseas. Uh, department stores, everything. So there's tons of competitors, right? Um, some advice I got when I first joined pharma, and I was lucky, I joined in, in Durham, so I always had a very nice call point. But um, it was a PA when I was like, give me the best advice you can give me as a new rep. And she said to me, she's like, Vaughn, all your products work to a certain extent, or they're not going to be in the market. They're all safe to a certain extent, or they're not going to be in the market. Be nice to my staff. If you walk in and you can see that I'm behind in my schedule, don't ask to see me, you know, be known for the right reasons. And I was like, huh, so it's partnership that people are looking for. And that's more important now than it's ever been because of the number of competitors that are out there. Um, and our consumers, they know that. I mean, the front desk person of your derm or plastic or med spa sees anywhere from eight to 12 reps a day, you know, so you're not special unless you stand out. Uh, in the right ways. You could stand up for the wrong ways as well, and you'll never be invited back to the office. Um, but that's, that's huge, you know, and it's not going on in your agenda, really finding out how my goal and the customer's goal is the same and presenting that to them to where they comprehend it. And I've been telling my reps, I'll ask you, Haley, whether it's a romantic, platonic, professional relationship, what forever have, have people said is the foundation of a relationship? What do you, what is it? Trust. What else? Start with uh, the C. Hi. 
It starts with a C. Consistency, credibility. Communications, communications, oh, okay. what people usually say. <laughs> God, you're, you're killing my, my thing here. So people usually say- Clearly, I haven't, I haven't mastered that one yet. Probably why I have such great relationships <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Well, I always tell them that they're wrong. It's not communication, it's comprehension. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what I communicate to you. It's how you comprehend it. And I think that's what we forget when we're in the field, right? And so that's one thing. Partnerships are really important. But going back to your question of, are the events still going to go on? They're never going to go away. Um, and the thing is, like, in 10 years, none of them have really evolved except for getting more luxurious. And like you said, the Rolexes and whatever. I, I saw one event where they were, like, test driving Porsches or something, you know, um, which I'm not sure how that strengthens a partnership or get someone to take out a small mortgage to buy a device from you. Um, but I will say at Revision, we really, we love those partnerships. Um, and it shows we started an event last year called the Elite Retreat and you have to qualify to go. Um, and that's all, you know, was, you talk to your BDM about that, but qualifying to come, we built this event and it was scary last year. We we're like, we cannot crap the bed. What do we do with this? And it was all about our customers and partnering with them. We brought in competitors of ours. We talked about what are, what are the newest technologies on the horizon. Um, we talked about the industry where it's going, how to scale. We brought in a financial consulting firm and everyone, we did a survey beforehand. And one of the questions was, do you have a, a five-year exit plan? And even if you're not planning to exit, you should have a plan. And so many people didn't know. We brought in all these resources. We got nothing out of it. And one of our um, key opinion leaders, she even said, she was like, we're waiting for the plug of, okay, so here's your promo with Revision Skincare. This is what you have to buy in at, but it never came. Mm-hmm. We talked about Revision for a very short period of time at the beginning, and we never asked them to buy anything, none of that. And people that left and implemented the vendors we brought in and all those things have really grown their business. And we've gotten great feedback. We're doing our second one that you are going to be a keynote speaker as, you know, there's a little spoiler alert for you guys um, in July, but really that's the focus, not buy more revision, but how can we partner? And it's about being that rep that comes in and cares about the business, not just where you get paid in the business, but the health of the business as a whole. And if you do that and you can show that, then your customer trusts you. And if they grow, you grow. That's just how it works, you know, but the events need to evolve you know, not just more luxurious, but I think the partnership, like I was saying, is so important now and people are just missing the mark on that still. Everybody says they want to do that. Everyone. Like name a company that's not saying we're going to be the best partner with our client, with our, you know, practice or right. whatever. They all say it. It's but how? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, you know, so I think it's interesting because as you and I as friends, right, have advanced into different roles in, in our industry and some of our colleagues and our, our friends too, you know, have, have gone to different companies and moved into leadership roles and things. There's a 80% cohort of people that we worked with that were selling devices that have probably been at five different device companies since then, you know, and they move from yeah. one to the next doing the same thing, going, trying to go to the same customer to sell a different you know, device and it's that something's got to give. And like, from my perspective, I get hit up. I mean, name, name someone like a rep who hasn't called them and like, Hey, can I come in and, you know, can, let's partner. And I'm like, okay, well, you mean you want me to try to sell your device for you? Because everybody's saying the <laughs> same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's the truth. And I don't do the whole affiliate back this back. I don't want kickback. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's right. That's my opinion. But I also think it muddles what we just talked about, which is being somebody who is focused on helping the customer, period. And if you are the With one no who motive. does that, they will buy from you. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. a simple formula. So let me ask this question. So I'm just curious your opinion. Um, what do you think is harder to sell, um, skincare or capital? <laughs> and then I'll tell you my it's thoughts. So- <laughs> It's so different. Um, capital, you know, you're going in again, you're trying to get them to spend a small mortgage and it's like, here's a credit app. Give me your social security number. You know, it's a big deal. It's a big upfront investment. So that's hard to gain trust and to get past those gatekeepers at that point, you know? Um, but I mean, I hate to say it, but it's still true. 
for the majority of laser reps. By the time that transaction hits and that device is delivered, you're out, you're done. And for whatever reason, in two years, when that same rep comes back that the client's been complaining about for two years and says, buy this, they still do. You know, it is what it is. Um, I will say that it's a hard job. It's very hard. Now, the grind of a skincare rep is different. Mm-hmm. Skincare reps are still uh, responsible for prospecting and opening new, opening new accounts and all those things. But they have two sales. They sell in and then they have to sell through. Because if they don't sell through products on the shelf, they're not going to reorder. They're not going to make money, you know. So um, for goals that are similar quarterly to a device rep, it takes hundreds more transactions within that quarter for the sales rep uh, at a skincare company to hit that number. Um, so I think you have to be, the, the grind is different, but I think you have to be a little more dynamic and creative to be able to do the skincare side. Um, which if we think about our history, when we were growing up in the aesthetics industry, right? It was very clear, it was very linear. It was skincare to get into injectables, to get to capital, and that's your career path. And even coming to take this position at Revision, coming from a laser company, I was torn. I was struggling with them. I taking a step back in my career because I've already made it to capital. Um, and at the time I did it, it was 2020. It was towards the end of COVID. And that year, skincare flourished because we taught our customers how to sell online, whereas banks weren't lending money and people weren't trying to finance anything because they couldn't see patients in their office. So um, they're different, but I think... Uh, Maybe capital is harder, but skincare is grittier. And I don't know. It's just, yeah. you know, I hope, hopefully you're getting what I'm saying. I know, what I do totally you think? Do. You, you have your own opinion. It's such a debate because um, I agree with a lot of what you said. I remember um, when, you know, selling capital and like I never had a New Year's Eve because it was. I was yeah. <laughs> like I remember sitting like waiting for someone to like sign the documents you know like it didn't matter they were like it, it was midnight you know oh okay yeah um, and I remember you know you sell like a few devices a quarter and so you know a handful and so you get that big win and it's like I remember like opening the sunroof and like celebrating and music blasting and, you know, driving home and like, oh, this huge, like, I, you know, feel, feel so accomplished. And of course, huge commissions and all of that. And then you wake up the next day and it's like, next, now go get another one. Yep. Right. And so, right. um, and then it's dry, you know, it's a long sales cycle. And so I would say capital is very challenging on the psyche, you know, whereas though skincare, it is, you cannot take a day off. Like you are you have to show up. You have to be there. You have to be present because if you're not front of mind, somebody else is going to be, you know? And so I think it's, it's way more taxing, like physically, you know, like, yeah, like (laughs) legit, like you're just in your car more, like you have to show up and be there. And so I think it's way harder than, I think that job is way harder than people are given credit for. And it's exciting to see reps making, you know, multiple six figure incomes selling skincare now. And, you know, obviously too, skincare just being such a huge part of, you know, an, an undercurrent of, um, of asset building business strategy in aesthetics, because there's recurring revenue models and now e-com and just so much to do so many ways to incorporate retail into your business growth plans that don't require, you know, a service provider putting their hands on patients, especially for a business owner who's also running their business. So I think it's all great. Um, and I just give props, obviously, to all the reps out there, um, you know, who you are, um, that, you know, <laughs> that are there. <laughs> doing the grind every day. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of times, in mo- you know, we have so many business owners who, who listen to this podcast and, you know, we are like, uh, another rep sometimes, or they, ha- they value their, the good relationships with reps so much that they're like family and they trust them and they're trusted advisors in their business. And I think that's the difference, right? And I, I love seeing companies that actually put their money where their mouth is when they say that, like we're doing things like elite retreat as an example, where we're actually, like you said, you guys brought a competitor in. That's crazy. You know, like that. You're just bringing value. Yeah. Like that's like a flex. 
Like that's how good, you know what I mean? Like, I love right. that. Yeah. And, and our scientific advisory board, it's a bunch of different, you know, physicians and we're not naive to know that they're on boards for our competitors, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, even being yeah. on the sharing the shelf space in an office, it just makes sense if you have knowledge of your competitors and know how you can work together. Um, yeah. And that's exactly what we did. And Chris Murray, when he opened up the elite retreat, he even said, he was like, you are in the room with some of your own competitors. We're in the room with competitors as well. What we're asking is everyone push their egos aside and you're here to share and help grow each other. And it was a very yeah. productive, you know, 36 hours. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And I, I had a similar conversation with Chris um, one time when he specifically talking about him. Um, I was thinking about this conversation where he said, you know, if, and this is, I feel this way, if you're worried about your competition, you don't have a unique enough selling proposition. Like it's a brand positioning problem, right? Like if you don't know where you fit, obviously a cleanser versus a cleanser, like I get, I get there's direct, you know, and buying for dollars and all of that. But if you can't figure out how to position yourself in a way where you can play fair and be strong in a competitive market, that's a challenge. And so we have to take, you know, reality into consideration and then teach our people and our customers how to um, leverage their, the things that they do exceptionally well and that they have to offer, that's going to help them stand out and become a stronger, res a better resource to their client via, via experience or results and all of the things, you know, so. Well, going back to what we were saying earlier, that, that goes with the reps and, and partnering, right? So yeah. if you're not strong enough in your relationships and showing that you value that partnership, then your competitor is going to walk in all day long. So it goes back to if you're not confident what partnership you bring to the table and execute on that, be don't just talk, you know, it be about what you're promising, um, then you're in the wrong space. And we, we used to talk about spec wars. Don't go in there and talk about, you know, my device has got a faster pulse duration and all these things. Same thing with us. Don't go and compare ingredients because, you know, the customer, the end customer is looking at a wash versus a wash. Our customer is looking at a wash versus a wash. But who would I rather work with? Who is a better partner? That's yeah. really what is making you relevant in the space. Yeah. Do you feel like some of that um, relationship, nurturing, cultivating, growing, like that sort of soft skill type stuff that you're talking about, um, do you feel like that has any, that stems from female leadership or is that something that's talked about more? Um, because you have a fee, you, you work for a female led company than maybe other companies that don't have that just innate sort of motherly instinct, so to speak, you know, you know, um, yes and no. I feel like it is either a characteristic you possess or not, um, because I love getting to know my reps and my customers and all those things. But as far as, you know, we can talk about a cold call. There are some reps that go in and they're just trying to build build the relationship, big air quotes, right? But it might take you 12 to 15 touches for them to remember your name because, hey, it's Vaughn again. Can I speak to anyone? But you're not making impact. You're not showing value. So I can go in and do the same thing and be very cordial and say, hey, Kaylee, good to see you again. I'm Vaughn. I've met you before. Uh, but if I can add some kind of value to your day as a person or your business, that's going to make impact much faster. And that's still a relationship. I feel like that's more of a substantial relationship as opposed to that 12 time where they finally see you just because you're nice and they feel bad. You're mm -hmm. still not a valuable partner, you mm -hmm. know? So I'm not really sure if that's because of, I will say that female leadership has softened me up in the best ways. <laughs> I'm not going to say it hasn't. <laughs> um, being able to have female, female mentorship has been very different in a good way. Um, but yeah, I think it's more of a characteristic as opposed to whether it's male or female leadership. Because I've met male reps and male leaders that are softer than I am. So no, I just think no totally. Funny. And I, I, I don't think it's totally dependent. I just was curious, like, you know, you, when you have a woman running a company, they, you know, might innately value more of those like soft skills. Um, but I do agree with you. I think it's just kind of person dependent too, and, and how you value being a resource to your customers at the end of the day. Um, so what would you say to, let's say a rep that, you know, I ducked out of industry like a while back. So I would love your opinion. <laughs> 
<laughs> that, that's uh, what we're calling it now. Duck, you ducked out. <laughs> ducked out. <laughs> peace, peace out. Peace out. Um, but yeah, I was. I'm just curious, like you know, how you have seen these shifts impact um, opportunities for reps to grow in aesthetics, and the the industry's grown. So there's just, I think, more in general. But what would you say to a rep that's looking to advance in their career in aesthetics, you know, when they get up every day, what are they doing differently than someone that isn't, you know, what is someone that's like, I want my, I have my eye on climbing that, you know, that ladder growing in a different way and taking on new responsibilities. You know, what, how does that rep show up differently than somebody who doesn't? Yeah. Um, you do the job before you have the title or the pay. That's usually what it comes down to. Right. Um, I would say be vocal to whoever you're you're reporting directly to and say, these are my goals. But what it comes down to, and this is what I feel like you and I learned, is with or without the support of who you directly report to, you can't lean on them for your growth, right? What are you reading? What are you listening to? How are you developing yourself? Um, and there's only so much you can do on your own, but never stop that. You know, I'm a lifetime learner, and I think that's what keeps me wanting to grow, is I'm going to learn new things. Um, so definitely, if you can have that conversation with your leader, put together a plan and say, I want, you know, physical things that I can check in with, you know, to make sure I'm growing in these areas. Can you help me? I think that's huge. Finding a mentor is great. Cause like, you know, we talked about earlier, uh, female mentorship didn't exist. You know, I had, I had a great mentor for a long time and we, we still stay in touch whenever we see each other at conferences and things like that. But, um, Bob Ingersoll, who brought me to this company, he's been my mentor for the past, you know, four or five years now, and I've grown so much. And he was introducing me to Maria Carell, our CEO, before there's any chance of me coming to work here, just because he said, you know, Vaughn, I came to this company to work for Maria, and I want you to meet her. Um, she mentors women in her free time. She likes to do that. And I met her, and I had more access to her than I had any other of my so-called mentors in the past. And we met one time and had coffee. And then um, when the opportunity came to come work here, and she was still at the time the only female that sat on the board, um, female CEO, but there's a lot more. Our entire marketing department is female. There's a lot more um, you know, female leadership in revision. And it's different and you don't really feel it until you get here. You don't know what you're missing until you get here, you know? And mm -hmm. when we talk about the mentorship, not a lot of people on a director level can say, I have access to my CEO. You know, we have coffee once a quarter uh, at least. And um, like I said, my career path was very linear, just based on my knowledge of what was available. And she's challenged me to learn different things and, you know, to learn about different departments and has given me paths to different, you know, places that I never knew I was, I was even capable of that were never on my radar. So I think that's huge. And that's how I've always tried to lead. But my leadership is only, it's limited to my growth and what I learn. So I'm only as good to my team as, as what I know. That's why I also continue on, to want to grow and have a mm -hmm. mentor. So have a mentor that's going to push you, that's going to teach you things. Um, yeah. And reps, you guys, you get a lot of drive time. You talk to a lot of other reps in the company, I'll tell you this, if you get off the phone with someone consistently and you don't feel good when you get off that call, ask yourself if you should continue to talk to that person. That's, mm. that's what I'll say about that because you got to keep your head in the game. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, would you say it's a red flag if someone's going to work for a company and there isn't somebody to mentor them? Um, yeah, well, it kind of depends on what, you know, why you're going to that company, you know, if it's for, if it's a stepping stone and you want to grow, I'd say be honest about that too. I've been in positions and hiring positions where, um, I've kind of had to sniff out that, Hey, someone just coming here as a stepping stone until something better comes along, you know, but if you're really wanting something and when I say something better, great example, I'm interviewing someone that's been in management for a, uh, rep position. My first concern is you are in charge. Why do you want to go back to this position and not be in charge? That's what I mean by, is this just a stepping stone? So be honest about what you want, what you want for a company and why you're coming. If you've ever interviewed for me and we're in that position or with me and we're in that position, I'm, I'm going to ask you, are you running away from a bad opportunity or are you running towards a good one? Because mm -hmm. I think that's something you have to ask. Oh, yourself, that's so good. Well. That's so good. That's yeah. one of my things. That is, I had to learn that the hard way too. Um, 
Yeah. So just, I just want to repeat that. So is this person running away from a bad opportunity or running toward a new opportunity? And that is a critical, there is like a, it, it's a fundamentally yeah. completely, um, it's a different, different mindset. It's a different, you're in a different headspace. Yeah. Exactly. Um, is it desperation yeah. or not? Right. Yeah, totally. So what, um, what, what's on top for the next phase for Vaughn? Are you, you know, <laughs> what are you working on? <laughs> Cause you know, you're talking um, about growth. So where are you growing toward? Well, so I moved to Dallas two years ago um, and I just bought a house. So I guess I'm putting down roots in Dallas. I'm working on that right now. Um, okay. And we, my team won region of the year 2021 and we lost last year. So uh, my immediate focus is bringing home the win where it belongs. And my team named themselves this year, the redeem team. So we're here to redeem ourselves in 2023 uh, and win region this year. So those are my immediate goals. Um, I've got some new blood on the team. So I've got a lot of people to get up and running, but we're just super competitive and, you know, last year was a weird year in the industry. I think we can all agree to that. And we were just trying to make it. But this year, the energy is different on the team. We're back, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then, I don't know, you know, I'm going to keep doing my job as best as I can and continue to continue to put my input in whatever I can until my next leadership opportunity comes. And hopefully that's upward, you know. Yeah. So. That's, that's what I'll say about that. But what I love about Revision is we still kind of function as a small company, even though we've grown a lot. So we have a lot of impact. Like I'm involved in a lot of things that most people at a director level aren't involved in. And that's where the continuous growth comes from. And also the trust of my mentors and my management of saying, hey, be involved in this. So that, that continued growth and that continued development of my career is still here. So as long as I'm still growing, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Well, if you aren't growing, you're, you're moving backwards, in my opinion. You're just, Same. you know, yeah, it's all about that growth mindset. I love that, Vaughn. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this great um, insights with us. I loved chatting about, uh, you know, catching up on our good old days, but also um, you know, <laughs> revisiting how things have evolved uh on the um device side and skincare side of things and obviously just some perspective from you know industry <laughs> like I said <laughs> um so it's been just a fun really fun conversation so um for anybody who wants to is looking for mentorship um or who wants to follow Vaughn or get to know Vaughn um where what's the best way to get in touch with you so for mentorship and things like that probably LinkedIn so just my first and last name and in revision, you'll find me. Um, my Instagram, you're welcome to follow it. It's minivan08, go figure. It's how my name is spelled. Um, and I'm, you can follow me there too, but it's going to be mostly posts about my dog, you know. Um, and, and also Black Tie Dinner. It's my second year on the board for a nonprofit called Black Tie Dinner. We're actually the largest single fundraising dinner in the country. Uh, been around for over 40 years. Uh, and we're the number one single a contributor to the human rights campaign so yeah. um and then the rest of the budget that we um that we bring in goes to north texas uh lgbtq plus nonprofits. so yeah. we're doing that this year and that's where what you'll see on my instagram that my dog so welcome to come follow <laughs> i love that and that's amazing work that you're doing too so all right. Well, everybody go follow Vaughn, check her out and um, contribute. And Vaughn, thank you so much for all this great insight and so fun to chat with you. Yeah, happy to do it. We've only been talking about it for like a year. So happy we got it done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I will see you at Elite Retreat. You will. Thanks, Kaylee. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.